from New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleons. Come in, Mr. Harris, Thank and you, take your usual chair there on the other side of the fireplace. Now, before we become further involved in the adventure which had to do with six Napoleons and a rather gory murder, suppose you say a few well-chosen words on a subject on which you have become almost as much of an authority as I am on the subject of the exploits of Sherlock Holmes. With pleasure, Dr. Watson. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's almost as much of a pleasure to recommend Clipper Craft clothes as it is to wear them. Say, are you in the market for a new suit of clothes? Well, Clipper Craft believes you're entitled to the very most for your money, even today in this era of high prices. That's good business for you, naturally, and it's good business for us, too. We've planned it that way by applying scientific American production methods to the fine old craft of clothes making. It's the great Clipper Craft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast providing year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs, and delivering the savings to you. That's why, at a friendly independent store in your community, you get beautifully tailored, fine-fitting, expensive-looking Clippercraft suits for only $40 and $45. Top coats, too, in fine coverts and worsted gabardines for only $40 and $45, and sport jackets at only $26.50. The values are downright amazing. Compare them tomorrow with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to return to your specialty, the adventures of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Yes, I must say it's an enthusiasm I seem to share with a great many friends and critics. As you probably know, there is a collection of erudite gentlemen all over the United States of America who are ardent Sherlock Holmes admirers, and who call themselves the Baker Street Irregulars. Why, would you believe it, they even argue with me about the accuracy of some of my stories. <laughs> Do they ever win the arguments, Dr. Watson? Well, <laughs> you know, Holmes always said I had a weakness for embroidering a tale. But that's neither here nor there. So here's tonight's adventure... The Six Napoleons. Six Napoleons? Why, good grief, Doctor. I should think one gentleman of that cal caliber was all the world could stand at a time. Or is it the name of an acrobatic troop? No, Mr. Harris, it's something even more unusual. As you may have gathered, Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard was a frequent visitor of ours in the old Baker Street days. Between him and Sherlock Holmes, there was a friendly rivalry. His calls were welcome because they enabled us to keep in touch with things at Scotland Yard. In return for this news, Holmes was sometimes able, with or without any active interference, to give some valuable hint on the solution of a crime. Uh, the word isn't sometimes, Dr. Watson. It's frequently. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> on the particular evening I'm referring to, Lestrade had come in wearing a preoccupied look. He spoke casually of the weather and the newspapers. Then he fell silent, puffing thoughtfully on one of his atrocious cigars. Holmes looked at him keenly. Nothing remarkable on hand, I suppose, Lestrade? Hmm? No, no, nothing in particular. Then tell me about it. Why, uh, <laughs> well, Holmes, there's no use denying there is something on my mind. Fancy that. Quiet, Watson. Well, to start out with it, has the Bank of England been threatened or has someone stolen the doormat at Scotland Yard? Well, as a matter of fact, the business is so absurd that I hesitate to bother you about it. On the other hand, though trivial, it is undoubtedly queer, and I know you have a taste for anything that's out of the common. Mm. In my humble opinion, it comes more in Dr. Watson's line than in ours. Oh, you mean disease? Well, madness, anyway, and a queer sort of madness, too. You'd hardly think anyone living in this day and age would have such a hatred of Napoleon that he felt compelled to break any image of him that he saw. Is that all? That sort of nonsense is no business of mine. Exactly, that's just what I said, but 
When the man commits burglary in order to satisfy his craving for breaking images, that takes it out of the doctor's province and into ours. Burglary, eh? That's more interesting. Give us the details, that's a good chap. Well, <clears throat> so far there have been four cases. Numbers one and two were reported four days ago. It was at the shop of Morse Hudson, who sells pictures and statues in the Kennington Road. The assistant had left the shop for a few moments when he heard a loud crash, hurried back and found two plaster busts of Napoleon lying shivered into fragments. He rushed out into the road but couldn't find the culprit, although several passers-by declared they had noticed a man run out of the shop. How much were the busts worth? Only a few shillings. Well, I thought you said there was a robbery. That's just one of those senseless acts of hooliganism which are becoming more and more prevalent. The third and fourth cases were more serious. Yes? Yes. They occurred only last night. In Kennington Road, and within a few hundred yards of Morse Hudson's shop, lives Dr. Barnicott, a well-known medical practitioner. By Jove, yes, I've heard of him. He has one of the largest practices on the south side of the Thames. Don't interrupt, Watson. No. Well, his residence and principal consulting rooms are in Kennington Road, but he has a branch surgery at Lower Buxton Road, two miles away. Dr. Barnicott's an enthusiastic admirer of Napoleon and had recently purchased from Morse Hudson two duplicate plaster casts of the famous head of Napoleon by the French sculptor Devine. One of these he placed in his home and one in the surgery in Buxton Road. Well? Well, when Dr. Barnicott came down to breakfast this morning, he was astonished to find that the house had been broken into during the night and still more astonished to discover that the only thing taken was the plaster head of Napoleon. It had been carried out and shattered against the garden wall. This is beginning to be interesting. And the fourth case? At 12 o'clock, when Dr. Barnicott arrived at his surgery, he found the window broken and fragments of the fourth bust strewn all over the room. And there's no clue as to the criminal's identity. Hmm. Those are the facts, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. Singular, not to say grotesque. Were the two busts smashed in Dr. Barnicott's rooms exact duplicates of the ones destroyed in Morse Hudson's shop? They were taken from the same mold. That's a coincidence, eh, Holmes? Yes, and it tells against the theory that the man who breaks these busts is influenced by a general hatred of Napoleon. How do you make that out, Mr. Holmes? Considering how many hundreds of statues of the great emperor must exist in London, it's too much to suppose that a promiscuous iconoclast would chance to begin with four specimens from the same mold. Mm, I thought that way myself at first, but... But on the other hand, this Morse Hudson's the only purveyor of busts in that part of London, and these four were the only ones of Napoleon that have been in his shop for years. Therefore, it seems logical that a local fanatic would begin with them. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Watson? Well, there are no limits to the possibilities of monomania, Lestrade. For example, there is the condition which the French psychologists call the idée fixe, which may be trifling in character and accompanied by complete sanity in every other way. A man who had read deeply about Napoleon might conceivably form such an idée fixe and, under its influence, be capable of any fantastic outrage. No, it won't do, my dear Watson. It won't do. Oh, why not? No idée fixe would enable your interesting monomaniac to find out where these busts are situated. Oh, all right, then. How do you explain it? I don't attempt to do so. Yet. But one thing is obvious. There's nothing abnormal about this bust smasher. There's too much method in its eccentric proceedings for that. In what way? But consider. In the Barnicott house, where any sound might arouse the family, the bust was taken outside before being broken. Whereas in the surgery, where there was less danger of an alarm, it was smashed where it stood. The affair seems absurdly trifling, and yet some of my most classic cases have had the least promising beginnings. You'll remember, Watson, how the dreadful business of the Abernethy family was first brought to my notice by the depth which the parsley had sunk into the butter on a hot day. I can't afford to smile at your broken bust, Lestrade. On the contrary, I... Hello, what's that? The front doorbell, of course. For the great detective, you do have your obtuse moments, Holmes. Naturally, I know it's the front doorbell. What I want to know is why it's ringing in the middle of the night. Come in. Hello, Mrs. Hudson. What's the matter? A policeman downstairs, sir, says Mr. Lestrade is wanted right away. What's up now? He said as how I was to tell you there'd been another bust busted. He said you'd know what he meant. It's becoming an epidemic. Confounded, why couldn't they have waited till morning to rout me out? He says you're to come right away, because this time there's a murder. Well, Mr. Harris, naturally, Holmes and I threw on our hats. I picked up my service revolver. And we dashed down the stairs with Lestrade panting behind us. Fortunately, a policeman had a cab waiting. We piled in hurriedly and drove off to Pitt Street, the scene of the crime.
Holmes, Lestrade and I dismissed our cab at the corner of the street. It was obvious that news of the murder had got around. Here we are, Holmes, number 131 Pitt Street. That must be the house where the crime was committed. Yes, and a first-class murder it must have been. Nothing less would draw such a crowd in the middle of the night. Notice the look of horrified delight in that messenger boy's face. Hey, let us through. Let us through, I say. We're from Scotland Yard. Oh, it's the yeah, police. Please. That's him. Come in, gentlemen, come in. Ah, Mr. Lestrade, thank heaven you got here at last. Well, if it isn't Mr. Horace Arker of the Central Press Syndicate. It's an extraordinary thing, Lestrade. All my life I've been collecting other people's news. And now that a real piece of news has come my own way, I'm so confused and bothered that I can't put two words together. If I'd come in here as a journalist, I should have interviewed myself and had two columns in every evening paper. Uh, Mr. Arker... Uh, you we... remember when the stand fell in Doncaster? Well, I was the only journalist in the stand, and my journal was the only one that had no account of it, for I was too shaken to write it. And now I'll be too late again with a terrible murder done on my own doorstep. Uh, uh, you'd better tell us just what happened. Uh, wait a minute, I'll call my wife. She was with me. Minnie! Minnie! The police have come. Oh, God be praised. What a night we've had. I was just saying to Horace, this is what comes of staying up late. If we'd been safe in our beds, we never should have heard the commotion. Uh, Mrs. And, uh... Arker, Mr. Arker, may I present my friends, Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes. Uh, how, how do you do? do, you do Sherlock Holmes? Dear me, is it as bad as all that? You see, Horace, I told you. Next thing you know, he'll be suspecting you of the murder. Now, now, Mother. I assure you, Mr. Harker, I am only here unofficially. Inspector Lestrade has charge of this case. Well, that's a relief anyway. Oh, well, I mean... Well, you see, Mr. Lestrade knows Horace, and that's something. I mean, well, you understand. That is, I... Of course. As a matter of fact, the thing that interests me most of all isn't the murder. No? No. It's the broken bust of Napoleon. Yes, that's it. It all started with that bust. I never did like the man, Napoleon, I mean. And why Horace wanted a bust of him sitting in the living room, we I'll never... No, Mother. Uh, but perhaps I'd better tell the gentleman just what did happen. Yes, I suppose that would be a good uh, well, idea. As uh, Minnie was saying, it all seems to centre around that bust of Napoleon that I bought for this very room about four months ago. Where did you purchase it, Mr. Harker? Uh, from uh, Morse Hudson's shop, Mr. Holmes, in Kennington Row. Uh -huh. Well, as you may know, gentlemen, a great deal of a journalist's work is done at night. I often write until the early morning. Just ruining his health. Now, mother. Well, tonight I was sitting in my den, which is at the top of the house at the back. I'd almost finished my work, and Minnie was trying to get me to come to bed. Just a few minutes, Mother. I'm almost through. But here it is after twelve again. What must the neighbors think, seeing your light burning all hours of the night? What does it matter what they think? Besides, you'll ruin your eyes. Now, Mother. What is it you've got to sit up for this time? <laughs> it's a new column we're running, Mother. Advice to the Lovelorn by Gwendolyn Desmond. Advice to the Lovelorn? Well, that, that's indecent. A man writing things like that. I know, Mother. But uh, better a married man than a single man. Oh. If I don't do it, they probably'd get that young whi whippersnapper Jones. And Lord only knows the things he'd think of with what is... What's that? Burglars. I know it's burglars. Ah, nonsense, Mother. It's probably just the cat. She's knocked something off the mantelpiece. No, I'm sure it's burglars. Very well. I'll go down and see. Oh, right. Harker, you're not going down there. Well, how else can I find out if it's the cat or burglars that made that noise? But they'll kill you. Nonsense. Give me the poker. Oh, dear, I wish you wouldn't. Now, you, you, you stay here. I'll be right back. Stay here? By myself? No, sir, I'm coming too. All right, Mother, but let go of my coattails. I, I, I can't. My knees are all of a tremble. Don't go so fast, Horace. Shh. Mother, don't talk so loud. If it is burglars, you'll scare them off. That's just what I'm trying to do. <clears throat> well, here we are. You see? <laughs> it's just something that fell off the mantelpiece. Oh, 
The hand-painted bonbon dish that Aunt Susie gave us for a wedding present. Smashed to bits. <laughs> you see? Look, Horace, look. What's the matter? The window's open. And that bust of Napoleon, it's gone. Where? Ah! Horace. Horace, did you hear that? It sounded like someone falling against the front door. Oh, it's horrible. Oh, Horace, don't go. Yeah, I've got to find out just a minute till I get the door open. Hello, there's, there's something heavy pressing against it. Oh, heaven uh, protect us. Uh, that's it. I, it's a man lying on the doorstep. And his throat is slit from ear to ear. <gasps> Will it wear? Will it be comfortable? Is it correctly styled? Clippercraft clothes answer these questions emphatically by delivering even today in this era of high prices the most amazing values you've ever seen. You'll wonder how it's done. Well, it's the great Clippercraft plan which concentrates the buying power of 1036 stores from coast to coast and delivers to you these beautifully styled, beautifully tailored clothes, including long wearing worsteds, at a friendly local store you can trust. Fine Clippercraft suits that look much more costly are only 40 and 45 dollars. Top coats and fine coverts and worsted gabardine are only 40 and 45 dollars, and sport jackets are only 26.50. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now, suppose we return to the house of Horace Harker, where Holmes is helping Inspector Lestrade to solve a bloodthirsty murder. Did you know the murdered man, Mr. Hucker? No, Mr. Holmes, I did not. They've taken the body to the mortuary. What did he look like? Tall, dark, and powerfully built. Fully dressed, but he didn't have the hands of a laborer. A horn-handled knife was lying in a pool of blood beside him. But whether it was his or whether it was the knife that did the deed, I don't know. Anything in his pockets? Uh, no card or letters of identification, if that's what you mean. Just an apple, some string, a shilling, a map of London, and a photograph. Uh, here it is. Excellent. Mm, a rather simian countenance, eh, Watson? Ugly-looking brute. And vicious, too, I should say. Yes, but look here, Holmes. What's become of the bust? Ah, the bust. Yes, of course, the bust. He wouldn't dare carry it very far. Someone might see him and identify him. Are there any empty houses around here, Mr. Harker? Uh, there's one right next door. No, that wouldn't do. Too dark. He had to have light. Dr. Barnicott's statue was found smashed in the passageway where the light from his front door illuminated it. There's uh, just one other vacant house in this block, Mr. Holmes. Uh, fifth to the right, under the street light. Excellent. That must be the one. Come, Watson, let's see what we can find. Wait a minute. I'm coming, too. Oh, very well. Oh, but you must come back, Mr. Holmes, all of you. You must be famished. Dear me, where's my sense of hospitality? I'll go and put the kettle on right away. Splendid. We'll be back before he's had a chance to come to a boil. Fifth to the right under the streetlight. That was what Harker said, wasn't it? Yes, but I must say, Holmes, I don't see what you can expect to find. It seems to me... Just that as we... I thought. Just as I thought. There's the fifth bust lying shattered in shards upon the grass. Ah, destructive brute. I'd give a great deal to know if he found what he was looking for. What do you mean? I can't explain now, but suppose we all meet at Baker Street tomorrow night directly after dinner, and I think I can promise you an exciting evening. You're, you're on the murderer's trail? Quite. In the meantime, you, Lestrade, see if you can discover the dead man's identity while I inquire into the manufacturing of those busts 
and see if I can trail the ruffian in the phonograph. Oh, that's right. Pick the most exciting chore for yourself. And the most dangerous. Don't forget that, Lestrade. Watson, don't quibble. We have a long way to go, and yet we've discovered some rather significant facts tonight. Let's see. I don't see anything particularly significant. In the first place, breaking the bust was not the sole object of tonight's criminal. Well, how do you know? If it had been, he'd have broken it inside the house or immediately outside. In the second place, the possession of this trifling bust was worth more in his eyes than a human life. Yes, I think I'm beginning to understand what he was after. Well, Lestrand, how about another cup of coffee? Uh, no, thanks. Two cups is enough for any man. I'm not the coffee addict you are. Mm, what a pity. It might stimulate the brain. Uh, now, look here, Holmes. You may think you see your way clear in this matter, but I have my own ideas. Yes? Yes. The dead man was Pietro Venucci. They knew him down at the yard, all right. He was one of the greatest cutthroats in London, a member of an Italian Black Hand Society, too. How reprehensible. A society that punishes its offending members by death. Well, this chap in the photograph was probably a member, too. The whole thing's just one of those Italian feuds. How simple. But um, where do the busts come in? And was it just a coincidence that the murdered man was working in the shop of Morse Hudson? I don't see why the busts have to be brought into the question of the murder. Oh, but they do, Lestrade. Those busts contain the motive for the murder. Oh, that sounds like plain lunacy, if you ask me. No, it's really quite simple. I found this morning at Mr. Morse Hudson's shop that the murdered man had been an employee of his for the last six months previous to which time he'd worked for the firm of Gelder and Company, the firm which moulded those busts of Napoleon, which someone had been so avidly smashing. Yes, but Gelder and Company are an old firm. They must have made thousands of busts of Napoleon. Quite, but it's only the six of this particular batch with which we're concerned. I must say, I still don't see. Naturally. Well, one afternoon over a year ago, the very afternoon those six busts had come from the mould, and while they were still wet, in fact, Beppo, another employee, was chased into the workshop by the police. It seems he'd tried to knife Pietro in a street brawl. Beppo? But who was Beppo? Oh, didn't I tell you? No. Dear me, how absent-minded of me. Beppo was the man in the photograph. The man he tried to knife that day, as you know, was the same fellow found dead on Harker's doorstep last night. You see, I told you it was a feud. The most curious part of the incident is that Beppo was holding something very carefully in his hand when he ran into the workroom. And yet, when the police overtook him, they discovered nothing of any interest on him. Beppo was taken off to prison, of course, and was released two weeks ago, the day before the first two busts were smashed. Yes, but Holmes, look here. You said there were six busts in that particular batch. So far, only five have been smashed. Where's the other one? The sales book of Mr. Morse Hudson shows that it was sold over a month ago to Mr. Joseph Brown of Laburnum Lodge, Chiswick. And now, suppose we pay that worthy gentleman a visit. If luck's with us, it should be an interesting evening. Yes, but Holmes, isn't it a bit late to go calling? Uh, perhaps Mr. Brown has gone to bed. I hope so, Watson. I sincerely hope so. going to storm any minute. Can't we come back some other time? No, Watson. The gentleman we're after is not to be put off by a little unpleasant weather. He must finish his quest as soon as possible. He doesn't dare delay for fear the police will be on his trail. I only hope he hasn't been successful already. Here we are. This gate says Laburnum Lodge. This is the house. No lights. Mr. Brown has gone to bed. I knew it. Good. We won't rouse him. Suppose we confine ourselves to an inspection of his shrubbery. Yes, but look here. I... <laughs> Someone's coming along the road. Quick, get behind this hedge. But I believe... Yes, he's opened the gate. He's coming in here. Possibly Mr. Brown coming home from a lodge meeting. No, Mr. Brown's probably accustomed to using the front door. You're right. He's trying to get in a window. By Jove, it's a burglar. And a very expert one, too. He broke the lock like a veteran. He's going in. Hadn't we better follow him? No. We'll get him on his way out after he's found what he's after. That storm's going to break any minute now. Here he comes. He's got something white under his arm. 
Get ready. Get him! 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 All right, put the handcuffs on him, Lestrade. Yes, sir. He's a tough one, he is. Gentlemen, there allow is. me to present Beppo, one of Italy's master criminals. So you did want the sixth Napoleon, eh? Don't want to talk? Very well. Oh, this is the man who committed last night's murder, eh? Yes, this is the murderer and the bust smasher. Well, now that you've got the sixth Napoleon, what are you going to do with it? Lend me your top coat and I'll show you. Uh, oh, very well. Oh, but first come over to the street light. Come along, you. You know what's good for you. Come along. Non ho fatto nulla. Non so niente. Now, first, I wrap the bust in Watson's coat so we won't lose any of the splinters. Then I follow Beppo's procedure and smash it against the lamppost. So. Oh, oh, here, that's my best top coat. You'll ruin it. Now, we spread the coat on the ground and look among the fragments. Made from empty. No, benedizione, no, la perla è mia. La perla nera è mia, è mia, è mia. Our friend Beppo seems to be rather excited. Davila. Keep him at a distance, Lestrade. I don't want him to no, do any no. snatching. Stand back no, now, no, you. Come no. on. Now. Now, let me see. No. No. Yes, by Jove, here it is. Shut me. What? Why, it's... It's a tremendous black pearl. Yes, Watson. The famous black pearl of the Borgia, stolen from a museum in Florence two years ago. Devilishly beautiful, isn't it? Well, that was an exciting discovery, Dr. Watson. But look, there are one or two points I don't understand. How did Pietro figure in the story? Why did they quarrel? How did the pearl get into the bust of Napoleon? That pearl had been stolen by Beppo and Pietro. They quarreled and Beppo tried to kill the other chap. He had the pearl in his hand when the police broke up their fight. He ran into the workroom and buried the pearl in one of the soft busts of Napoleon standing on the workroom table. From that time, the feud was on. The Strad was right there. Each one was determined to get the pearl. Pietro didn't know where the pearl was hidden and Beppo was in jail, so... The odds were fairly even until Beppo got out. Pietro knew his only chance was to shadow Beppo, which he did, and met his death. And that disposed of both of them very neatly. And now, Dr. Watson, do you think you'd like to give us an idea about next week's story? I think I could be persuaded, Mr. Harris. I think I could <laughs> be persuaded. Um, let me see. Uh, next week, I think I'll take you down to the Port of London, where... Holmes and I discovered a fantastic East Indian temple among the wharves and warehouses. There, in front of a hideous idol, we ran into our old friend, Professor Mariotti. I call it the adventure of the serpent god. <laughs> My hair, what's still left of it, stands on end when I remember it. The makers of Clipper Craft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Adventure of the Serpent God. <laughs> Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems.